Okay, welcome to our second lecture on the historiography of the Salem Witch Trials, and we're going to uh, work our way from Boyer and Nissenbaum uh, through to the 1990s and the years immediately preceding the publication of Mary Beth Norton's In the Devil's Snare. And uh, by way of a short recap, uh, let's remind ourselves of the... Uh, uh, the the one piece of scholarship that seems to, uh, in some respects, still tower over all other scholarship on the Salem Witch Trials, and that is Paul Boyer and Stephen Nissenbaum's uh, book, Salem Possessed, which uh, is uh, famous mainly be for its innovative mapping of the uh, geography of witchcraft accusations uh, that shows a definite split uh, within Salem Village uh, that is in part political, it is in part social and economic, uh, and um, has been an extremely influential uh, interpretation of the witch trials that, uh, as I said, has, has made it a landmark uh, work in the, uh, in the field. But uh, since then, of course, um, uh, historians have sought to mainly build upon, not tear down, the Boyer-Nissenbaum thesis. And the first to uh, tackle this task was uh, uh, John Putnam Demos's uh, book, Entertaining Satan, uh, Witchcraft and the Culture of Early New England, which uh, came out in 1982 and won the Bancroft Prize for Early American History, a very prestigious award for early Americanists. Um, and um, it is uh, the first systematic study of witchcraft in New England in the 17th century. Up until this point, uh, not surprisingly, uh, all the attention is on Salem and what happened there. Uh, with only a flickering of an acknowledgement, yeah, yeah, there were other witchcraft trials before that, but they're nothing compared to this, and that's definitely true. Um, but what Demos wanted to do was take a rigorous statistical analysis of Salem and see how it compares to previous trials uh, in terms of who gets accused, who goes to trial, what are the conviction rates, and things like that. Uh, and uh, after his analysis, he came to the conclusion um, that uh, uh, seems to confirm what, you know, most historians uh, already pretty well knew uh, anecdotally, but now we have hard uh, evidence to back this up, and that's that most accused witches uh, were older women on the, from the uh, lower rungs of the social ladder. Um, and that, you know, that, 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 that witchcraft and fear of witchcraft was something that patriarchal, uh, political, and religious leadership used to keep women in line uh, and was also used by elites to control the lower orders, that is, the poor. Uh, and that this, among other tools, were designed to maintain community harmony. Uh, in what was otherwise a pretty uh, divided and fractious early New England society. This goes back a little bit to uh, Max Weber's uh, thesis about the function of religion. Max Weber was a, a German sociologist who published in the 1940s an extremely influential work on the place of religion in human life, and uh, his conclusion uh, was that uh, uh, religion essentially is a tool of social control. Uh, and this is something that he actually you know, sort of derived from earlier works. It goes back to, you know, Karl Marx, uh, you know, who said more or less the same thing. Uh, and uh, Demos sort of confirms this in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, a whole wing of, of what's called the New Left uh, you know, scholarship uh, emphasized social and, and economic conflict uh, as something that moves uh, 
societies around, uh, either forward or backward. And that's what Demos is talking about here, is that this is a, uh, you know, that, that religion is a means of social control, but it's not just that. It's, the, you know, it's about maintaining uh, men's control over women. It's about maintaining uh, a certain political caste, uh, having control over, over a community and over a region or a society. Uh, and that Salem was kind of an explosion uh, uh, where f- certain forces chafing against these constructs were trying to, uh, you know, kind of break out of them a little bit, and you have those eager to preserve those constructs looking to, uh, um, you know, uh, put down, you know, incipient rebellion, whether it's about uh, the lower classes going after the upper classes, whether it's about women chafing against male authority, or whether it's the the non-religious chafing against religious authority, um, and what he all you know what he came you know concludes quite obviously was that Salem was special. Salem was unusual, um, and uh, that but that it was not simply just the largest and most interesting of an otherwise undifferentiated mix of similar episodes in the past. In fact, this, the earlier episodes established a pattern that Salem broke with. Um, now, this book came out in 1982. He put out a revised edition in the uh, 1990s, um, but even that revised edition does not really improve on the flaws in the work uh, which have to do with fairly antiquated notions of masculinity, femininity, and sexuality, because obviously a lot of what's going on here with Salem has to do with aspects of masculinity and femininity and sexuality. Uh, and he is, you know, kind of mired in this, you know, <laughs> men are men, women are women, and small furry creatures are small furry creatures, you know, and that there is no, there are no gray areas among those, you know, between those groups. Um, And uh, he doesn't seem to uh, acknowledge, uh, you know, uh, deviations from established gender and sexual norms as being a part of what's, what was going on uh, in New England with these witchcraft cases. Uh, and in this respect, I see the influence of Starkey's Freudian perspective still surviving in this. And, you know, to some extent, Demos is not going to, to diminish these Puritans for their uh, uh, beliefs in the occult or the supernatural. Um, but at the same time, he does tend to see what's going on psychologically in Freudian terms, which by 1982 were starting to fall out of favor. And then we come to Carol Carlson's uh, book, The Devil in the Shape of a Woman, Witchcraft in Colonial New England. Uh, And I want to take a moment to highlight her career. Um, and, you know, because, uh, you know, uh, uh, as we've talked about Boyer and Nissenbaum, that they were at UMass Amherst. Uh, Demos uh, taught at a number of, uh, a couple of different places uh, in New England, very, very prestigious universities. Um, Carol Carlson uh, received her PhD from Yale University in 1980. So we're talking about just a, a couple of years before Entertaining Salem came out. Um and before writing uh, The Devil in the Shape of a Woman, she co-edited a, a, an edition of the, you know, or a, a compilation of the Journal of Esther Edwards Burr. Uh, you know, she was the, uh, the, the daughter of the great, uh, first great awakening uh, preacher, Jonathan Edwards. Uh, it came out in 1984. It's out of print now. It's been out of print for a, a very long time now. Uh, but then came out with uh, the devil in the shape of a woman. Um, so, what is what what is interesting here is she basically published nothing 
after 1987. Uh, the, uh, she, she, uh, she wrote, obviously, a doctoral dissertation, uh, which got her a job at, uh, um, you know, uh, at, at the University of Michigan. And uh, the, the Journal of Esther Edwards Burr, being a collaborative project, somehow managed to get her tenured and promoted to associate professor, and then the devil in the shape of a woman got her promoted to full professor uh, sometime after 1987. And since then, she did basically nothing. Uh, and uh, she's retired now. Uh, but uh, all of the other historians that we're going to be talking about were highly accomplished and, and, and authors of multiple works. And while you know, the number of books and articles you've published are not necessarily a, a measure of your worth as a historian. They, you know, the, they are a measure of such things when it comes to advancement in the ranks of the professoriate, especially at such a prestigious tier one institution as Michigan. Uh, and it's curious, uh, I did a little bit of investigating about this and found out that when she did apply for tenure, uh, for all intents and purposes, she was basically uh, basing it off of being, you know, one of, of two people who edited the, a journal. So it's not based necessarily on any uh, significant original historical research. Uh, and... Uh, that the 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 she, she you know they originally uh, denied her uh, tenure application, uh, but uh, she threatened to sue and claimed that uh, there was gender bias and that uh, there were you know so that she threatened to sue based on 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 that claim and the university backed down and granted her uh, tenure and promotion, and then uh, uh, publishing Devil in the Shape of a Woman was certainly enough to get her promoted to full professor, but it's curious because you're expected to maintain an activity in, in academia beyond reaching full professor, and there's little evidence that she did anything of the kind apart from writing some book reviews and and she did publish an article for the uh, uh, the Salem Possessed retrospective, which uh, we're gonna you're gonna be reading uh, towards the end of the of the course. So I wanted to bring that up because, like I said, she's a bit of an outlier here. But let's get into her book and talk and and, and talk about it in, in a little bit of depth. And beginning with anybody who's writing a book about a, a particular subject, especially one that's been written about a lot, you've got to figure out how does your work different? What does your work do that builds on uh, or surpasses previous works? And you have to identify uh, how the previous scholarship has done this right and this right and that wrong and that wrong. And she begins by pointing out um, that uh, with the exception of of uh, Marion Starkey, all of the scholarship on the Salem Witch Trials uh, has been written by men, and uh, some women have written uh, some articles, uh, but that she accuses all of them of essentially a patriarchal and elitist bias, uh, and that her work is going to expose these, expose this, and then blow them away. Um, and in this respect, what she's going to do is she's going to carry the, the, the banner that Demos raised in pointing out the social control aspects of the Salem Witch Trials, and especially the degree to which there was uh, patriarchal pressure on women to control them and on elites to control the poor. Uh, and that explains uh, her findings, which were grounded largely in Demos's research about who tended to be accused and who tended not to be accused, uh, or at least suspected of being witches. And she focuses, quite rightly, I think, on the fact that uh, it seems 
perfectly all right for elite men to dabble in alchemy and astrology and 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 uh, uh, things like that, um, and that tended not to uh, bring them under the slightest suspicion of any kind of occult activity. Whereas uh, middle and lower class women uh, sometimes dabbled in folk medicine. Sometimes they had to. Uh, especially when it comes to midwives. Uh, elite women almost never served in this function. Uh, it was always middle and lower class women who uh, served as midwives. And because of these things, they were, were going to be more vulnerable to witchcraft accusations. Again, this is something that uh, Demos brought up. Uh, in 1982, she built, you know, Carlson builds upon this and focuses a bit more on the fact that what's going on with uh, wise women and midwives is that you have a situation that by the 1680s and into and, and 1690, you have a, uh, an informal medical profession. There, you know, there's no such thing as a, you know, uh, uh, there's no such thing as the American Medical Association. You do not have anything more than maybe, um, the equivalent of doctors' guilds, but most of those are in Europe. Uh, the practice of medicine in America in the 17th century was extremely loose and unregulated, and practically anybody could claim to be a doctor if they wanted to. Um, very often, they're just, they were just peop, you know men who um, had a few sets of pliers for pulling teeth, some scissors for cutting hair, and some. Uh, needles and, and small blades to open up a vein to balance out your humors when you have a fever. And that's pretty much it. Not many uh, men anywhere in colonial America in the 17th century were uh, uh, professionally educated as doctors at any European university. There were no uh, medical schools uh, at Yale uh, or Harvard, for instance, or the College of William and Mary at that time. Uh, uh, you didn't have anatomy classes or anything like that. So uh, most of your health care providers in the 17th century are going to be these people like folk doctors, wise women, midwives, and of course with the things that they do depending on their application, depending on the reputation of the uh, practitioner, you know, may be entirely innocent and even respectable to an extent, or it could veer into the suspicious or possibly the downright uh, satanic. And uh, obviously women, again, are going to be a target because more men are starting to want to get into the business of dominating everything related to the medical field. That includes midwifery. And uh, you have, in, in the very late 17th century, the very beginnings of criticism of midwifery, suspicion of midwifery as witchcraft, and uh, uh, that the delivering of children should be uh, uh, you know, dominated exclusively by male doctors. Now, you may recall in an earlier lecture, I talked about how when uh, women... Uh, went into labor and were having a baby, that this was a very gender-segregated kind of event. The women of the community would gather around the, the mother and help her through her labor away from the men. The men would be in another part of the house or even not even in the house, and they would just simply wait to get the news about the, the outcome of the, uh, of the birth. And so you have the separate spheres, but now you've got men trying to encroach on that on that that space. And in this respect, because of the the, the soupçon of of uh, of possible witchcraft uh, attached to midwifery, you've got an all male clergy who are more than happy to uh, assist uh, doctors, whether professionally trained or not, in trying to intrude upon. Uh, that previously all-female space. Uh, and bottom line, uh, when, it's, when we're looking at who was accused of witchcraft, who was suspected of witchcraft, the progress of the cases, who tended to be convicted and executed as witches, the fact that they were 
all you know almost exclusively women proves her genuine genuine conviction that it was entirely down to misogyny it's just w men hating women um and gender competition uh and uh that explains salem it also explains the witch hunts in europe in previous centuries um and to any uh, sort of uh, beady-eyed student who raises his hand or her hand and says, well, wait a minute, men were accused of witchcraft too, uh, especially in Salem. Uh, Carlson uh, acknowledges that this was the case, but she says that this is uh, irrelevant, um, that uh, the fact that men were accused of witchcraft she argues that the majority of the men in 17th century New England who were accused of witchcraft were accused during the Salem uh, event, and that that was tied up with what Boyer and Nissenbaum were talking about with regards to socioeconomic and political conflict, and that that, that you know that was a separate kind of thing going on. And so, in that respect, she affirms Boyer and Nissenbaum's thesis regarding Salem specifically, as well as emphasizing, as, as uh, Demos does, is that Salem is unusual in some respects. Uh, but uh, she would argue that it is not quite as unusual as Demos uh, would you know, argue. So then we come to our next uh, landmark book, and that is Bernie Rosenthal's Salem Story, Reading the Witch Trials of 1692, which came out in 1993. Uh, and he begins by pointing out that the problem with previous sto studies of the witch trials is that they are all, to one extent or another, beholden to and, and, and clouded by a mythology that has attached to the event uh, that that is also um, of all the regions of early America, New England has the most of you know the the, the greatest aura of uniqueness, uh, for lack of a better term, and a lot of this has to do with the American Revolution uh, and and the, the the status that Boston and Massachusetts had as the you know as, as seed beds of the revolution and this where the Battle of Bunker Hill happened and all of these things uh, the Boston Tea Party before that you know and 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 that New England has this kind of uh, uh, romantic kind of mythological aura about it and Salem is part of that uh, and when you throw in, the popularity of Halloween, and you know, then Salem takes on an extra dimension. It become, it, it, you know, it's sort of something of not so much a tragedy as just this amazing event, you know. And and uh, um, he argues that most historians are writing about Salem because they're attracted to it because it is fun to explore the occult. It's fun to walk into the darkness where the trees are all bare and gnarly, bats are flying around, it's a full moon, and you know things are making noises in the dark that scare you. It's like walking through a haunted house. And that tends to seduce you and, 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 uh, and, and blind your objectivity. And so... He argues that this is a problem, and you've got to get out of that. Uh, and uh, he also argues that another problem with previous works is that historians are too focused on trying to explain Salem in terms of its antecedents. What was happening before the trials that seems to have brought them on? And he says that the historians, especially Boyer and Nissenbaum, but others, get so fixated on that that they don't pay sufficient attention to the trials themselves and the individuals involved to examine their motives. What are you know? Why, uh, you know, did people accuse a certain other person? Why did a person confess when they knew they were innocent? Uh, 
you know, uh, what, you know, why did someone agree to sit on the court of Oyer and Terminer? Why did Governor Phipps, uh, you know, open the court? Why did he close it? Why, you know, nobody was looking at that stuff, he argues. And that's, a, and that's a, an extremely valid criticism of, of a lot of the previous works. And he also said, let's, so based on that, we need to know the motivations, which means we need to go into the uh, primary source documents, and as you know, Boyer and Nissenbaum did some of this. They published a three-volume uh, uh, compilation of a lot of these documents that were taken from the WPA transcriptions of all extant documents. Ro Rosenthal found documents previously, uh, you know, not known to exist, but he also went back and saw that there were lots of problems with the WPA transcriptions uh, and that there were words that were misspelled there were words that were misunderstood, misdefined, uh, and that, in any case, uh, living in the uh, late 20th century, we've tended to have forgotten a lot of how uh, certain words had a different meaning, and there are turns of phrase that, you know, the means of which are, you know, uh, we didn't even bother to try to find out, well, what does this phrase, what did this phrase mean to people you know, uh, in, in the late 17th century versus the way it sounds to us today. And that if you go back and you investigate what those things meant and understand that a lot of the court documents were written by different, you know, people at different times, that even one document might have two, three, or four different people who, you know, men who were writing on that, that's significant to understand. Uh, and that the context and the contours of meaning change once you are better acquainted with the, uh, the, la the landscape of 17th century American English. Um, and when you do that, you're able to better understand what each individual person was, you know, was probably thinking. Uh, and uh, what he, what, what, what Rosenthal does is he essentially says, well, Boyer and Nissenbaum had, you know, they, yes, there was the Porter Putnam feud. Yes, there seems to be this division inside the village between East and West that, you know, with regard to the, a farming community versus a mercantile uh, community to the Southeast. That doesn't explain what was going on, really. Um and, of course, he then goes after Carlson and says, well, look, yes, a gendered reading of the witch trials, certainly, you know, yes, but it goes too far. And all of them suggest, going, and Mary, you know, you can go back to uh, uh, Marion Starkey, right, um, with the psychological thing, and, and all of it seems to speak of a kind of determinism, that, 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 that things happened... Uh, in a way that nobody directly involved could understand or control. And that, that makes them kind of impersonal kind of objects of historical or, or so sociological, economic, political forces. Um, this is very typical of New Left historiography, by the way. Um, you know, it, it's something that, uh, you know, it's a, sort of a revival a Marxist reading of history that, that organizes societies into groups called classes, and that it is the conflict of these classes that tends to move things around. But what the problem with that is it also says, well, if you are lower class, that means that you all tend to think this way and act this way because of that. And if you are of a different class, you're going to think and act you know, differently because of this class identity. There's a certain truth to that when you're looking at very, you know, on a very macro level when you're looking at something like uh, political movements or the history of an entire nation over two, three, or four hundred years. But the closer in you look at a certain event, the closer in you go geographically, the closer in you go in terms of demography and looking at individuals, the more that those things tend to break down, these ideas that everything's moving according to these um, group identities. 
Uh, and so Rosenthal wants to get away from that a, a good bit in trying to understand what happened in Salem. And so he boils down to what, you know, to three things essentially to, to explain what happened. Number one, uh, Salem happened because of religious conflict and a desperate campaign to preserve second generation Puritanism. Uh, George Burroughs, in this respect, represents uh, a, a, a deterioration of Calvinism and Puritanism that increase in Cotton Mather vehemently oppose. And so their specific ire against Burroughs indicates why, to some extent, he might have been identified as the ringleader of the entire thing. He's the, he's the, uh, the, you know, he's the black minister of the coven of witches because of this. Uh, and so that's one layer of what's going on. Another layer has to do with political corruption in Governor William Phipps' administration. Um, this is something that you'll read uh, Emerson Baker take up uh, vigorously in, in A Storm of Witchcraft. Uh, thirdly, uh, simply put, the core group of afflicted girls were liars and frauds, uh, and they were making everything up out of uh, a desire to have attention, out of a desire to get out of work, out of a desire to um, not have to occupy a role that they did not want. And what's more, most of the principal, principal elites were perfectly aware of the fact that these girls were lying and uh, that, uh, you know, nobody was willing to do anything about it. And so this is part of what constitutes this miscarriage of justice. So from uh, Rosenthal's point of view, the Salem Witch Trials are less about Puritanism in general and their fear and belief in the supernatural and more about people finding ways to identify scapegoats when things don't go their way. And that this boils down to an all-too-human trait of refusing to accept personal responsibility for their failures, uh, whether they are uh, the failures of a John Godfrey, for instance, who just can't seem to make anything out of himself and therefore uh, attacks other people uh, in order to try to build himself up. Or if you are a Governor William Phipps, unable to control um, this, this, uh, 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 this contagion of suspected witchcraft and trying to deflect his own responsibility for that failure, which results in the spread of the contagion. And in this respect, what his argument is, is that when you look at people in the 1690s versus the 1990s, there's, there's not a lot of difference as far as the things that motivate people and the things that move them around. Uh, and in this respect, I think he is echoing a little bit uh, what Arthur Miller was saying in The Crucible, that the, you know, the, that witch hunting was exactly the same as red baiting, uh, whether it's the 1930s or the 1950s, uh, and that people do this all the time. And uh, I think there's a, there's a saliency to that observation. Um, the only problem with Salem's story, to my mind, I think, is that he goes so far in a direction of trying to get away from Puritanism and belief in the supernatural and all of that, is he goes too far with that. And he does, he seems to dismiss uh, the very real world of wonders in which Puritans lived. Uh, and uh, that, you know, it, he seemed to think that uh, William Phipps or Cotton Mather or, or, you know, Samuel Sewell, for instance, should have been able to look at what was going on with the same clarity that we in the present day might have and be able to, to, to point out, hey, wait a minute, that can't be true, or that has to be false, or this, this, the, you know, these girls are frauds, obviously. Um, that is not something I think uh, 
was fully possible. Um, I think that to an extent Rosenthal is correct. I think there was a there, and we know there was a there was a lot of accusations generally made that the afflicted people were making it up, or if they weren't making it up, they were simply and tragically mistaken about what was going on. But you can't expect uh, late 17th century people to have the same sort of uh, critical thinking skills that late 20th century people have. Uh, and so in that respect, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, um, something that veers into what historians call presentism. That is to say, when you take... Uh, an incident from the past and assume that people at that time should think the same way as we would today. Uh, and that is the cardinal sin of the historian's profession. Uh, it is something that I warn my students about all the time. You cannot blame people in the past for not knowing what we know now. Uh, it's tempting to do that. Uh, you know, but at the same time, you know, you you know, take for an example, um, the fact that uh, uh, lead is poisonous, and there seems to have be a lot of evidence that people who came into contact with lead in sustained amounts uh, suffered uh, serious mental and intellectual problems. Uh, but lead pipes carried water. For most of human history, you know, as far as uh, there being plumbing is concerned, uh, lead was a component of of uh, of uh, people's make you know the makeup that people applied to their faces uh, in the past, um, and uh, you know we know it's poisonous and we know we shouldn't you know but people in the 19th century you know when they started preserving and packaging food in tins or whatever they were originally lead canisters uh but you know you but at the same time because we figured this out by the 20th century means doesn't mean that we can go back and look at the ancient romans and say you idiots you didn't you know couldn't you tell that the you know no, they couldn't, and, and, and so you can't do that any more than it's fair for someone from the distant future to laugh at what we do or think and, and uh, realize, um, you know, you would, that, 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 how could you not know, for instance, that, oh my goodness, all you got to do is mix three parts Tabasco uh, sauce with eight parts water and you have a cancer cure-all. How did they never figure that out? Well, how are we supposed to know that? You know, I mean, uh, you know, that's that's one of the things that uh, I, again, I warn my students about this all the time, is that uh, uh, you can't criticize people in the past for thinking something about life, the universe, and everything is true um, when they don't have enough information to come to a different conclusion. Now, um, at the same time, if there were people at that time who were criticizing some institution or some conventional wisdom, then you can. So a good example of this would be something like slavery. Uh, you can't uh, dismiss um, slavery in the 17th and 18th centuries uh, as being, oh, well, nobody questioned it. Nobody, you know, it was like they couldn't have known. Not true. 17th and 18th century people at the time uh, uh you know, uh, challenged racism and challenged the institution of slavery, for instance. So it is perfectly acceptable to criticize slave owners uh, because people at the time were criticizing them. Um, but yes, you go back in the distant past, and the fact that they didn't, they didn't know uh, how to do something, you know, and because there would be no way that they could have known that, uh, you, can't, you can't belittle those people. Uh, so, uh, to some extent, Rosenthal is, is open to the charge of presentism because he seems to blame those elites for letting things get so far out of hand uh, because they should have had the same kind of, uh, of rational thinking skills uh, and critical uh, thinking abilities that we now pride ourselves on on having that they didn't have it back then is not entirely their fault. So then we come to the next uh, major work before we get to uh, uh, 
Mary Beth Norton's uh, book, and that is uh, Elizabeth Rice's uh, Damned Women, Sinners and Witches in Puritan New England, which came out in 1996. Uh, Elizabeth Rice is a, an emeritus professor of history at University of Oregon, and uh, she does a lot of work uh, in, in gender history, history of sexuality, uh, and, uh, and uh, she, she's now doing, you know, she's been doing some stuff on like history of medicine and, and uh, uh, gender reassignment surgery, things like that. So um, what she did uh, in 1996 was come up with uh, an interesting kind of synthesis of entertaining Satan with devil in the shape of a woman that I would argue is much more balanced and responsible than Carol Carlson's book. Um, and Carlson acknowledged ideas of Puritan masculinity, but first of all, she prevents them in a very two-dimensional way and then simply dismisses them as being part of a just absolute need for power and control over women, which Rice says it's certainly that's a, a component, but that's not the entire definition of Puritan masculinity any more than submission to male authority is entirely what Puritan femininity uh, is about. And to, you know, to uh, uh, illustrate this, what she argues is that the Puritan idea of sin being intertwined with the supernatural as it was uh, is something that made uh, uh, men and women more alike than unalike uh, than uh, previous studies have ever addressed in any way, shape, or form. In fact, she says they basically never consider the extent to which, uh, you know, they mention witchcraft as a religious crime, but uh, they don't get into to enough of the, you know, they'll talk about belief in the supernatural, they'll talk about belief in God and Satan, but then that's about it. So um, when she gets, you know, when she digs down into it, uh, she's, again, she's she's more interested in all of, uh, of New England rather than just Salem, but then, of course, if you're going to write a book like this, Salem is going to be the big, the big one, and it's going to dominate whether you want it to or not, um, but what she does is point out that Salem, to some extent, is unusual and an outlier, but only because of its scope and its scale. Uh, uh, and yes, there was a deviation in terms of what uh, goes on in the dynamics of a witch trial, but other than that, it still proceeds more or less in the same way as any other trial does. And, and yes, a lot of the same kinds of people are accused. A lot of the same kinds of people are suspected. Uh, you know, in this respect, she, you know, you know, she points out the same kinds of things that Carlson points out, but it's more balanced in presentation and it's a more, and, and it supports her argument better, I think. And as far as uh, her, her fixation on sin is concerned, Rice, I think, points out that the, you know, sin is, uh, is a universal attractant and that men are just as vulnerable to fall into it as women are, with the difference that, yes, it was assumed that men uh, might be as vulnerable to fall into it, but then once falling into it, they, it is easier for them to find the spiritual fortitude to get out of it uh, than women are. And that, and this goes with, uh, with Carlson to an extent, they believe that women are much more likely to surrender to satanic temptation and that this does uh, express itself more in the sexual realm than it does anything else. Uh, it was a belief in the 17th century that women were literally the weaker sex, not just physically and spiritually and mentally. Uh, they are more likely to be overtly sexual. They are more likely to uh, 
be lustful and uh, direct their sexual energy uh, outside of the bonds of marriage, even outside the accepted mores uh, of what you know uh, of sexuality in general. So, lesbianism is going to be more of a uh, of a feature, and and Carlson tiptoes around this, but ultimately is unwilling to get into that. But Elizabeth Rice is a little more willing to get into that aspect of it, and that uh, you know, and 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 points out that. As far as cases of of uh, sexual deviancy are concerned, it's pretty balanced between men and women being accused of homosexual activity uh, or some other kind of uh, sexual deviancy. Um, but that doesn't change the fact that you know that, that that's one of the situations where the facts on the ground don't necessarily match what is the conventional wisdom. And the conventional wisdom of the time was that, yes, men are more uh, spiritually strong and better able to resist temptation um, than women. Uh, They're more capable of reforming themselves than women are. Uh, But, you know, when you look at the actual cases of such things, it's pretty balanced between men and women. Um, Another thing that Rice does is that she uh, puts Satan more at center stage of Puritan religious life. Um, and, and that fear of Satan himself, not just of the satanic or fear of those whom Satan has tempted or otherwise controls, um, you know, sort of animating their fears about witchcraft or the occult. She points out that, you know, the, the, a lot of this has to go back to Satan himself and that Satan is a figure that is universally dreaded and feared uh, uh, with with a, a degree of terror that is something we're not familiar with in the modern day, right? Uh, and... Uh, what, what Rice does is that she challenges then Rosenthal, uh, you know, for diminishing the, the, the role of the belief in the supernatural and fear of witchcraft as being a precipitating factor in the Salem witch trial. She brings that back into it, but I think in a, more, in a way that's a little more clear-eyed and certainly not fogged by the romanticism of New England and the witch trials that, that Rosenthal... Um, complained about. But, obviously, there are other aspects that historians have not uh, still, you know, had by that point had not addressed, and that's what's going to motivate Mary Beth Norton uh, to begin researching. Uh, You know, she read, you know, she read Damned Women and, and reviewed it, and said it was a fantastic book, but said, okay, well, uh, she, she's provided us one of the clearest uh, synthetic works on witchcraft uh, in New England. But with regard specifically to Salem, there are still some questions and there's still some aspects that she didn't address. And that inspired her to, to write In the Devil's Snare and find an entire realm of events and phenomena that previous historians either were completely unaware of or barely acknowledged as having anything to do with what was going on. And I'm speaking specifically of the uh, the frontier Indian wars and the imperial wars um, that began in, in the 1680s. Um, and... Uh, that's going to be the, the you know that's going to be Norton's great contribution to the historiography of the Salem witch trials, and that concludes our survey of the historiography of the Salem witch trials. And I thank you for tuning in, and I will catch you later.